Very good. Mr. Brownlee, uh, welcome to the court. Um, Mr. Brownlee was arrested, uh, I believe, within the last 48 hours, and there is not a criminal complaint on file. May I have the appearances, please? The state appears by Deputy District Attorney Angelina Gabrielle. Uh, Mr. Brownlee appears in custody uh, virtually via Zoom with Attorney Hoagland also via Zoom. Attorney Hoagland is making a special appearance just for the purposes of bond today. All right. Thank you, Mr. Hoagland. I appreciate your cooperation here today. Uh, Attorney Gabrielle. Your Honor, um, the state is asking for a bond hearing today. We are asking the court to um, set bond at this time at a million dollars cash bond. Um, right now, the charges that we are examining are for first degree intentional homicide with a dangerous weapon and possession of a firearm by a felon. The information that we have so far is that on Mar March 8th, 2021, um, Kenosha Police Department dispatch received a 911 call from Sharnice Brown um, at about 5.20 p.m. Um, in listening to that recording, Ms. Brown can be heard screaming for help, crying, um, saying he's trying to kill me, help me. He's about to kill me. He's killing me. His name is Raynan. He stabbed me. He's got a gun. Help, help. Then you can hear scuffling sounds. You can hear what sounds to be like stabbing sounds. She again repeats his name that it's Raynan Brownlee. She says he is killing me. He is killing me. Help me, please. And then there's silence um, while the line is still open. And in the background, you can hear the voice of a male yelling um, with the use of profanity, who you effing, who you effing. And then there are sounds that appear to be um, either striking or stabbing sounds. Uh, the dispatcher asks Ms. Brown if um, she is still with her. There's silence. And then there is the sound of what appears to be a shotgun going off. Um, that shotgun, uh, seconds later, Officer Courtier from the Kenosha Police Department arrives at the residence. Um, at that time, Mr. Brownlee exits the residence with his hands up. He's covered in blood, um, both on his clothing, his shoes, the knees of his pants. Um, when the officers enter the residence, they find Ms. Brown um, in the back stairwell. There's a serrated blade on the floor. There was a shotgun in the hallway. And there's a, a tremendous amount of blood throughout the first floor and on the stairwell going from the kitchen to the side exit. She's not responsive. She's apparently unconscious at that time. Um, officers observe numerous puncture wounds. Um, they do move her and attempt life-saving efforts. They are unable to revive her. Um, the Kenosha Fire Department arrives and their EMTs also attempt life-saving measures, um, which were unsuccessful. And Ms. Brown was determined to be deceased um, at the home that day. Um, the autopsy was performed yesterday um, the cause of death was determined to be shotgun wound to the torso and multiple sharp force injuries. Um, the doctor who performed the autopsy observed stab wounds to the head, torso, and left upper extremity. Um, significant injuries included to the left hemothorax, fracture of the fourth rib, injuries to the right carotid artery, the right jugular vein, the left venal ring vein and small bowel. They also um, observed a shotgun wound to the left shoulder where the trajectory was from the back to the front. Um, and the, the projectile, the wad and the pellets were recovered from Ms. Um, Brownlee's, um, excuse me, Ms. Brown's body. Um, Mr. Brownlee did speak to detectives. He did admit to stabbing Ms. Brown um, using two knives at least seven times. He admitted to shooting her once. He um, indicated that she was on that the back stairwell in a kneeling position at the time that he shot her. 
Um, he says that he also stabbed her in the upstairs bedroom in the closet. He admitted that he stabbed her while she was on the phone with 911, which is which were the sounds that we believe we heard. Um, he did try to explain his actions as self-defense. Um, the version that he gave at this point seems inconsistent with the evidence that were observed, um, in particular, the shotgun to her back to the forward, um, that they were in an argument that the, the children observe, children heard. There were six children in the home. They left the residence when the argument began, so they did not witness the crime, but they did hear the argument, um, at least in part. Um, Mr. Brownlee did not have injuries consistent with self-defense or consistent with his version. Um, his injuries were to his hands um, in a directionality consistent with the knife slipping as he's holding it in his hand, um, which would be likely considering the amount of blood that was discovered on Ms. Brown's body at the time that the officers arrived. Um, there were prior threats by Mr. Brownlee to Ms. Brown. In fact, the phone records revealed that the day before he was angry with her and um, sending her threatening text messages because he believed that she had been cheated on him over the weekend. Um, he says, you played me all weekend. Have fun tonight like it's your last. You already cheated. The crime is done. Just remember you're saying the state can have my kids, they're better off. I don't care what happens to me. Life is over to me. I'm done. I can't take it no more. And then he also sent her a text saying your balloon release party is coming, which Miss Brown's party, uh, Miss Brown's family relates, explains that they were having um, an event for Ms. Brown's brother who had been murdered in Michigan where they were going to release balloons in commemoration of his life and death. And so um, it appears that this text message by Mr. Brownlee was warning Ms. Brown that her balloon release party was coming. Um, he does admit that he sent that text message. He denied that it was a death threat. Mr. Brownlee is a felon. Um, he denied being a felon in his interview with the detectives. He was convicted of possession with intent to deliver marijuana in Kenosha County in 1993 CF 366. Um, he does have um, what the family say are unreported domestic violence incidences with Ms. Brown. Um, he was convicted of battery in 1990 criminal damage to property in 1999, battery and bail jumping in 1998, disorderly conduct and damage to property in 2000. Um, and then he received a disorderly conduct ordinance in 2019 where he was fined. Um, so the state is asking for the bond at this time based on a probable cause finding. And we would ask that the initial appearance um, be scheduled for Friday if that's possible. Why so long, Attorney Gabrielle? You, uh, well, I will, I will pause on that in a moment. We'll get back to that issue, um, Mr. Hoagland. Your Honor, um, the state has presented very thorough, comprehensive uh, display of evidence. I would say that this is not the appropriate time. Uh, I mean, this is a bond hearing. The purpose of bond is to ensure future court appearances. I don't know that the extensive play-by-play uh, -play -play was entirely necessary. Um, I would suspect that it was meant to evoke uh, an emotional response uh, to be more punitive on the uh, leading side of this case. Um, we recognize that the allegations are severe and the offenses are um, grave. Uh, however, the purpose under statute uh, under statute is to ensure future court appearances. Um, Mr. Brownlee does not have any uh, missed court appearances that I'm aware of. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, he's never been in a warrant status. Um, um, 
anytime this side of 2000. Um, and uh, as far as I'm aware, um, uh, he does not uh, um, none of his underlying allegations. Uh, for some reason, I wasn't able to find uh, a lot of these allegations on CCAB. I, I don't know if there was a different name or something, but it sounds like these were uh, mostly um, uh, not violent uh, displays that would put the public at risk, um, which is also a concern when setting bail. Um, I would uh, point out that um, Mr. Brownlee is currently the sole uh, caretaker for his uh, two twins, both 10 years old. Um, he is 51 years old and he's spent all of those years in Kenosha. Um, he has his mother here and two sisters as well, all of whom uh, you know, are here to tie him down, make sure that he uh, will make his future court appearances. Um, the fact that he's lived here his whole life means he's a minimal flight risk because he has nowhere to fly to, uh, if I'm being honest. Um, he graduated high school from Bradford. He drives trucks for Cisco, and he's been doing that for four and a half years. Uh, he has gainful employment to further tie him to the community. Um, he has a valid driver's license and a car, a reliable way to make any future court appearances. Um, and it's my understanding that he is uh, very eager to um, fight these charges going forward. Um, they are severe and it, I do not expect that he would present a flight risk uh, um, on uh, for these charges. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, thank you. Um, I've heard uh, the recitation by Deputy District Attorney Gabrielle. And I've also heard the arguments from Mr. Hoagland. Um, on the issue of probable cause and, and the filing of the complaint, frankly, uh, Mr. Hoagland essentially conceded uh, that there is a voluminous recitation of evidence which prompted the question in my mind why the complaint can't be filed tomorrow because you've got that information right there. There's enough probable cause in this case to occupy its own zip code. That, Your yeah. Honor, we can file it tomorrow. It's just the and, and, that, and that is going to be the court's order. Okay. okay. Now, that said, I want to address the issue of bail, but I also want to correct a misimpression uh, that Mr. Hoagland created uh, because it is a misstatement of the law and, uh, and I am concerned to the extent that uh, a mistake can be made. We're all human, we make mistakes. But I want to read section 969.01 of the Wisconsin statutes, um, which deals with eligibility for bail prior to conviction. A defendant arrested for a criminal offense is eligible for bail under reasonable conditions designed to assure his or her appearance in court. Now that is what Mr. Hoagland said and he is correct. But then it goes on to say, protect members of the community from serious bodily harm or prevent the intimidation of witnesses. Those factors are all relevant in this process. It is not just, will the person show up in court? And it is disingenuous and a misstatement of the statute the only state one of those criteria. Now, that is in many cases, the, the essential and quintessential factor, but not in all of them. And um, there is some solace in that in 969.01 sub four that says if bail is imposed, it shall be only in the amount found necessary to assure the appearance of the defendant. So yes, that is there but those provisions coexist with each other in the statutes. So I do wanna create at least a correct impression of what the law says in this area. Um, and among the factors that, that we all know are the severity of the crime, the strength of the evidence, uh, whether or not there was a past situation in which a violation of release bail violation of bail jumping was there, uh, factors pro and con, all of those are relevant. 
and the deputy district attorney uh, gave a correct recitation uh, of that that wasn't disputed. It includes a bail jumping. Now, much of this record is relatively old. That's true, but it doesn't just go away when something like this happens. It is an extremely violent crime. It's one that it was not committed with the children present, but they had to flee the home. It is one which not only endangered one person, but endangers the safety and security of the community. And it's one in which the strength of the evidence is extremely strong. Um, and, and, you know, I, I stopped short of chastising the state for not having a complaint ready today because, you know, I know that these things happen, but quite frankly, um, as I said, there's enough probable cause there to occupy its own zip code. This one isn't even close in terms of probable cause. Now, whether or not there's enough conviction, evidence to convict down the road, we're nowhere near that stage yet. But at the base level of probable cause here today, there's an extremely strong case. So, you know, we, uh, and not to rub salt in any wound, but I, I don't want to have a misimpression with regard to um, our purpose today and what we are doing. I think there is a high incentive to leave the jurisdiction uh, and certainly not comply with conditions of bond. And I do think that there's a significant threat to the community. Uh, I think under the circumstances here, the $1 million requested by the state is on the more conservative end actually, but I will impose the $1 million bond as conditions of bond. Uh, I do note by the way, that uh, the uh, mother of the deceased here is uh, on the Zoom, and I note her appearance. Uh, so the uh, conditions of bond will be no contact with any member of the Brown family. Uh, secondly, uh, no alcohol, no non-prescribed controlled substances, no weapons, uh, no commission of any crime uh, while out on bond, report any change of address within 48 hours if he is released on bond not to commit any crimes while on bond. Those are all statutory conditions. The defendant may not leave the state of Wisconsin while on bond. If he has a passport, he will surrender that passport immediately uh, before he is released on bail. Um, and if he does not have a passport, he shall so inform the court. Any other conditions, Attorney Gabrielle, that the state is requesting? I would just ask for no weapons. I did say no weapons. Okay, I'm sorry. Then thank you, nothing else. One minute, Your Honor, if I may. Yes, sir, please. Uh, I just wanna clarify something for the record. Um, I don't think it's a proper characterization to say that I'm conceding anything as far as facts go. The fact that there's been no criminal complaint uh, provided and I don't have a private uh, situation in which I can talk with, with him. Um, I just wanted to clear that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Holden. I, I appreciate your situation, I, I believe me. Um, so at this point in time, the next step will be- Excuse me, this is Sharnice's mother speaking. Can we please not allow him to return to my daughter's house because that is my daughter's home and her children's home and we are not even ready to uh, sort through that at this point in time? Ms. Uh, Ms. Brown, um, I thought I may have covered that in my no contact with any member of the Brown family, but- uh, you do raise a point that if there's any doubt about that, um, no contact with the residents at, what is the street address, Attorney Gabrielle? 1720 19th Avenue, I believe. Um, is it 17 or 73? It's 1704 73rd Street. Yes, thank 1704 73rd Street. Yes. 1504 73rd Street. All right. So we'll, we'll add that in there. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Now, the next step in the process will be what's called a, well, actually, there'll be an initial appearance, probably, there'll be an initial appearance tomorrow at one o'clock or soon thereafter as a matter may be heard. At that time, the complaint will be filed and I assume that they may revisit the, the bail conditions set by the court at the time. And certainly they can make new arguments on the issue of bail. Um, at that time, uh, assuming the defendant will be represented by counsel and he is held on bond in excess of $500, uh, which is likely the case, there will be a preliminary examination, a preliminary hearing scheduled within 10 days. 
that is a hearing to determine whether there's probable cause that a felony was committed and that the defendant probably committed it. It's not a trial. Um, so that's the next step in the process. Um, and obviously, um, those are, it is a public hearing, as is the uh, hearing tomorrow, the continued initial appearance. Anything else for us to take up today? No, Your Honor. Hearing none. Uh, we are in recess from that case, and we'll pick another one. Thank you. You're welcome.